And thank you, Eliza, Stuart, Brittany, everybody else on earth, I want to thank. Um, I'm curious, before I get started, if anybody, maybe particularly under the age of 30, got the uh, little intended pun in the title? Adele, f setting fire to the rain, conspiring with the rain? Yeah, okay, that's my problem with puns, yeah. <laughs> People don't get that stuff, so, okay. It could have been lessons from the Dell, but I said, lessons from a Dell, and okay, anyway, <laughs> enough said. Um, I, um, so that was my title, because I'm going to talk about the, most of the Dell, a little bit of a, a project at, uh, another project at the University of Virginia at Campbell Hall, but I thought maybe I should also have more of a, a TED Talk type title, TTTT, uh, streaming on and offline, um, since this is a project, the Dell is very much about streaming. And I did look at a lot of TED Talks uh, just to get a sense of how they do it. And I, I noticed a lot of them had graphs and charts, usually on a global scale. Uh, so I included one little graph-like section through the Dell. Uh, I don't even know what it says, but anyway. <laughs> but uh, streaming on and offline, I think, uh, for me, ultimately, um, is not a bad title. Um, for me, streaming is a kind of dreaming of uh, lost um, pasts or worlds. Uh, I grew up in Northern Virginia and uh, spent my time in creeks, um, not unlike my daughter there on the left-hand side. Uh, and those creeks have long been piped and covered over. Um, so I think really um, one of the important sub-themes for me in this talk is the, the trying to um, bring back and evoke uh, those things that are lost and to really use what we do um, to speak to constituencies that maybe that aren't always acknowledged. So um, like uh, Kevin in, at the outset talking about, uh, this isn't just about water. Um, there, there are other aspects of what we do through the creative and art, artful uh, management and manipulation of water that allow us to re-engage with the natural world. Another interesting or important uh, theme for me is doing projects that incorporate um, and revel in some combination of natural and cultural history. And I know that um, uh, Steve just mentioned uh, the important uses of history and what we do. So uh, hopefully you'll see to, to some extent uh, uh, our acknowledgement of, of history in, in particularly the Dell project. Um, this is not the Dell, this is a, a more modest project we did. And you see it in the lower left, it was uh, at the Department of uh, Game and Inland Fisheries at Virginia. Uh, and it was just a field office really but they allowed us to do a small uh, bioretention basin and, and some porous paving as part of that. And obviously it's great that they would want to do the echo their mission kind of in the landscape. But the, the thrilling part for us was that within that first year we had, a, we got an email from one of their biologists, herpetologists, uh, who, who, who made a note of how that bios, how that bioswale was operating and the species, the number of species of uh, amphibians in particular that they had found there. And, particularly the species of salamander that you see highlighted there. And I take that as a, as a real um, virtue or compliment because uh, salamanders are, seem to be such a, a, a key species in terms of indicating the health of our environment. So again, if, anything, if we can do anything to bring back the, the, the quieter or hidden uh, constituencies as well as the more obvious ones like us and people. So the Dell um, is a project, uh, and this goes back, um, um, not unlike Steve's, about eight to ten years ago. Um, it's a, a project um, on the uh, edge of the historic core of the grounds, but it's actually a historic piece of property, as I'll note in a few minutes. And the diagram is simply trying to show that um, there is about a 170-acre watershed that the Dell proper actually uh, drains or receives water from. And on the so same slide, you'll see uh, in the upper right-hand corner the very small project, uh, much more ephemeral moving water in, in Campbell Hall. So I'll mostly speak to the Dell, but allude to Campbell Hall at the very end. If you look at a context uh, aerial view of uh, the Dell, you see the uh, lawn in the foreground um, the, in the rotunda on the far right. And then at the very top, you see the Dell. So it's, you can see the close proximity. There is a quite an elevational difference, but there's close proximity to the, the co historic core. So that's looking. Uh, that's a, a slide looking west, whereas the uh, the map or the plan on the bottom is actually oriented north. So you can try to reorient yourself there to see the relationship of the Dell to the the, the lawn itself. Uh, more specifically, if you look at the the project site uh, on the upper portion of this uh, slide, 
you see what we, the conditions we had to work with. And it, this really was a, um, uh, a somewhat uh, discontinuous and fragmented and, and worn out landscape where the water was completely invisible because it had been piped in the 1960s. Um, so our, our project was really one of daylighting uh, the creek, bringing it out of the pipe, as well as creating a, a kind of stormwater ponding facility. To, and, and the entire project was about both uh, water quality and water quantity uh, management. Uh, I should, as an aside, say that uh, all the projects we do, but in this one in particular, there, there are tremendous collaborations among many, many um, good people. And this one um, was uh, prefaced by, and I probably should have even noted it, that little tiny diagram you see um, uh, just above the plan it shows the, the discontinuous Meadow Creek in red is uh, where it's piped and blue is where it's daylit uh, when we started. But th so this project was actually a site uh, acknowledged or recognized by a, a, a great master planning team for stormwater that worked on campus that included uh, Cahill and Associates, Brittany should appreciate that, and Andrew Pogon. So that, that, that work set the stage for what we did and they, they actually had pegged this site as a potential uh, project or demonstration site to prove some sustainable strategies for stormwater. So their, pro their master plan went back about 10, well, 15 years now. So back to the site of existing conditions, you can see how constrained we were in places. We had to work around uh, a, a set of a memorial tennis courts as well as basketball court and, and surface parking that we could not change. We tried, we tried early projects that moved these things, but the cost was prohibitive and, and the associations in terms of memorial uh, tennis courts uh, said we had to stick to this very irregular boundary. So you see what we did, we, we tried to create a meandering creek, but we had to kind of channelize it next to the, to the uh, tennis courts, uh, and then we used the lowest property or lowest land uh, uh, just below the parking and uh, basketball courts as the ponding site that I'll explain further. Uh, this uh, illustration, I think, is, is helpful because it does put this into some historical context. Um, there are multiple histories to this site, um, but what you see here is a 1930s view and uh, in relationship to the more current view below uh, with the, again, the, the lawn is actually just off this, but you see the dell. Uh, the point is this, that, that even back to Jefferson's day, this territory of the dell was agricultural land for some of the um, professors. And he used the waterways that came out of Observatory Hill uh, for water collection for the university uh, and for ice. And so he actually had ponded it in a few places even back in the uh, early 1800s or mid-1800s when the university was developing. Later, this became a golf course, interestingly, prior to the 1950s, 60s, when they actually graded the site out, buried all the water, and uh, built a series of dorms and, and recreation areas. So, but I think the point here is there was a history of ponding on the site that we were trying to draw from. Um, but we put it in a different, uh, different position and configured it somewhat differently. Another, another sense of history, the importance of history on this site, um, was that the low ground that we built the pond into, or series of ponds, um, was actually the at one point, the, the property, the garden of uh, the first athletic director at the University of Virginia, Dr. Lambeth, and he loved Italianate gardens, had created one in the Dell. You can see the remnants of it here. It was mostly in ruin, um, and so we were making, we wanted to make some effort to acknowledge that. He even had a little basin of water that actually took some of the water from the creek that kind of had once come through here. So this is, and you can see how our site was not only derelict, but kind of had been taken over, uh, the kind of insurrection of invasives that uh, had, had taken over the site. And so I want to highlight that particular point because this is the transformation from existing conditions and trying to at least preserve some element of his garden folly. So this is that same view after we completed, probably this is a year or two after the, the, the pond, a uh, series of ponds was constructed and how we actually brought that particular uh, garden folly out of uh, the obscure background and really becomes a, almost uh, primary focus of, of the pond itself. Uh, another series of uh, drawings, I think, that communicate um, uh, design intent um, was that there was this 48-inch pipe under the entire site, obviously, because it was a creek that was piped. So you see on the far left of this is where we began to daylight the creek. There is an overflow area because since this has to flow back into pipes because just beyond the pond, 
Uh, it's not daylit yet. Or it might eventually be, but isn't yet. So we had a m managed system here, which meant that um, by design, we couldn't, we, we designed this for one to five year storms maximum, so we couldn't take a hundred year storm and blow out the system. So what happens, we have overflow structure on that left side where the water uh, in, a, in peak capacity storms will, will go back into that existing pipe, which wasn't changed, and, and re-enter the system. So uh, that's an important thing to realize. So what you really see here is how, what this was designed to handle, a one to two to five year storm. And so you, you have the Daylit Creek and the pond with its banks rising up, and we even designed a few ra rain gardens to take some of this overflow and infiltrate it back into the soil as part of the process. Uh, the maximum flood storage is almost the entire site. I confess I've not, had not in the eight or nine years it's been in extant, I've not seen this happen. It tends to, tends to only reach this stage, I should say this stage, uh, a little bit maybe beyond that, and, and there's some, most of the year it's in, in this more normative stage there. Uh, and then uh, just to give you a, a sense of the, uh, the progress of the Dell over time as it was uh, going under construction, I mentioned, uh, by the way, the Cahill and Andrew Progan did the stormwater master plan. Our collaboration on this project was with uh, Judith Nitch and more particularly Steve Benz uh, for, for helping with some of the stormwater uh, calculations and working with us very creatively. Uh, we also worked with biohabitats on some of the stream configurations and hydrology and rain gardens. So again, a very complex and an important collaboration, I think, upon many, with many people. So that was under construction. This is like w the first year just after it was planted. You see it in relationship to the tennis courts. Um, this is a few years later, and maybe the point should be made here that one of our significant constraints was we couldn't make the entire landscape naturalized because this is an important informal recreation space at the university. So we had to keep some lawn and intramural space. You see it being used here, I think, frisbee throwing. Um, so, but actually, from our point of view, from a design point of view, an artful design point of view, for that, the, us this was good because it gave us a chance to juxtapose a more managed, maintained conditions to those that would feel a little bit wilder, even though they, they also needed some degree of management. This is what it looks like more like today or last year, where it's the creek has, and, the, and the other side of the creek has really filled in, almost overfilled in over time. It's very fecund. Uh, and it's an even greater contrast to the lawn areas. Now that stream then gets conveyed. It's about a 1,200 linear feet of daylit stream from the overflow area and, and where the creek currently uh, comes into it to where we empty it into the stormwater pond or the forebay. And so you, here you see it kind of slipping through this very planted uh, precinct. Um, if you look back then, you see it, it comes through this um, stone wall uh, and slips under this simple wooden bridge. This is the primary path uh, that, that traverses um, uh, east-west uh, through, the, through the dell uh, into this stone-lined uh, uh, and metal-plated scupper, which you see here head-on if you're kind of looking to the south. So the stream very deliberately is designed and managed to convey water in a way that says this was designed, this is intentional, this is it's not, not meant to be natural. Uh, and an important and key word here too for, the, for this project as well as the, the Campbell Hall project is, is calibration. And this project is about how we design to calibrate these different storm events to really acknowledge and celebrate those events. Uh, so here you see it at pretty normal flow. So the, the, the four foot cascade or so is about uh, vertical, um, you know, almost dead vertical. And really lower flow, it'll pull back a little bit and in a, in a major storm, it, it gushes out. And you can see it falling, in, falling into the forebay. And we step back then, this just gives us a little more context of the, the, um, the daylit stream slipping on that left side of the tennis courts and then into this meander. It actually meanders above that as well. Into the forebay, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, and then the form of the forebay into the much uh, larger pond. But altogether, that ponding is about three quarters of an acre if you just want to get scale. I also like this slide because it maybe best explains one of our distinct intentions here was to really juxtapose the order, the kind of architectural or university order of, the, of Jefferson's grid on the left side with its lawn terraces, which aren't so dissimilar from the lawn terraces on the lawn, versus the more natural order of the creek meander and the topography on that right hand or north side. Um, I have a couple slides in here that look like this, and um, don't expect you to read these, but what's important is uh, when the project was conceived, we didn't have any monies for interpretation. They have finally gotten some monies for interpretation. They're going to have a series of, 
uh, signs, five of them all together, trying to explain how this functions as a working landscape. And that's important because most people who see this landscape now think it's just a beautiful park. They don't understand that it's actually functioning as well. So we want to explain its story and its history. Uh, and by the way, I should have mentioned Mary Hughes, who's the university landscape architect, who was absolutely seminal to, to getting this project uh, to fruition. And she's been behind getting these interpretive signs that will explain how the system works, how the four bay works in relationship to the pond, et cetera. Uh, a very important subset of, of the, the recent uh, establishment history of this project is that it is used now extensively by students and faculty and departments um, for in environmental sciences and civil engineering and landscape architecture and biology and botany. Uh, they monitor now the water quality uh, the, the, for, for uh, sedimentation and, and uh, chemicals, et cetera. Um, we, we're still getting the data in. I don't have too much data to, to portray today, but, but I do want to make a point. I think, and I've said it to Eliza before, that I think one of the more important things we'll, we'll do we, in, the, in the near future, it was brought up even in Kevin's talk, is the, are the metrics, you know, measuring how well these things are working so you know what to improve the next time around. But you can also tell that story to somebody who's interested in the success of your particular project. So a couple before and afters of the four bay under construction, and the, and the lower pond, what it looks like today. Uh, then if you look back on the pond toward the four bay, now that we're looking west, I uh, want to make a point about how we really shelved or benched this pond to receive um, wetland plants and to, to deal with some of the stormwater uh, rise and fall, but also for safety reasons, but dug very deep for water storage, obviously quantity, so it almost goes to, I think, 12 feet deep in, this, in the deepest part of this, which, you know, most people, especially at the university level, the legal office, are not real pleased with that, but with the benches, I guess we were able to get away with it. That's just after construction. That's what it looks like more or less today. That's uh, probably taken about a year ago. Again, you see, I think hopefully see in this one the juxtaposition of the two the distinct sides, very deliberate. And this really is one of my favorite slides because it really shows what the four bay is doing. You look at the four bay, it's small four bay, the color of that water after a storm, coffee color versus the color of the water beyond in a larger pond. So the four bay is created so that you can clean it out more regularly, as most of you know. And so they designed, this was designed to be cleaned out about every five years. It turned out it was six years in. This is a case, this is 2010. Uh, they're, they're actually uh, uh, cleaning it out. Uh, and they pulled uh, 35 cubic yards of sediment out of this. They also pulled 35 cubic yards of sediment out of the uh, overflow area. So 70 cubic yards of sediment in the first five to six years, that's a sediment that's not you know, going downstream or, and ultimately filling in the bay and causing problems. So, so back to calibration, you know, this, this wonderful kind of expression of uh, the storm event. Uh, and and it, it, it really, it, the great thing is there's a, it happens during a storm, but there's a lag time, obviously, because of the buildup in the watershed. So this is a play, people come now to the Dell with, after a storm because they know it, it is really eventful. Uh, another issue of calibration or place of calibration is in the weir walls for the four bay. And here we very deliberately designed a simple little 18 inch wide um, scupper break in the weir for every day uh, water movement, but then scalloped it back so that it would reflect on the one and two year storm event that you see here, which I think is wonderfully kind of sculptural and fluid. Um, and, and to me, this is kind of classic during a rainstorm or end of a rainstorm view, looking back on that weir as it's expanded to its full capacity. Actually, the biggest storms will go, actually go over the entirety of that stone line or stone weir. And it's also important that this ha functions and has a kind of beauty um, year round, uh, obviously where we are, it's wonderfully seasonal, wonderfully expressive, the, the picture postcard. This has become an iconic landscape though at UVA, which is pretty terrific. It's now appearing on coasters. That's, that's the sign, uh, right? You end up on a coaster, your you know, stamp of approval. Um, one, one, one final thing about the Dell is that um, because I was still teaching plants at the time, I, I wanted to use this as a demonstration garden. So this is one of the interpretive signs that are going up talking about not only native plants, but invasive species, animal and plant species, trying to educate people about, about why we don't allow geese in this site. But the way they control that is by border collies that they bring in irregularly. But in particular, as a plant teacher, I chose to, to subdivide the, 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 the linearity of the, of the project into three parts so that there was a kind of coastal plain and a 
Piedmont and an upland part, even though we didn't have that much topography, but I wanted to sort of show students that even within the same uh, family or, or gener genus like Magnolia, you have distinct species in different parts of this, this physio great physiographic state. So Magnolia virginiana in the coastal plain versus Magnolia tripitala in the uplands. And we can talk about their scale of leaves and expression uh, and where they naturally grow. The last project, I have just a few minutes, I'm a little over actually, um, uh, was, was a, 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 um, a little bit later, a few years later, when we did a series of additions to the architecture school and we got to do a, 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 an attendant series of outdoor spaces. And I'm only going to talk about the ones that are most expressive of stormwater. We, we worked with uh, um, uh, the architects on extending the building outdoors, a series of outdoor classrooms, outdoor workspaces, as you see on the left with these additions. And in, we had very tight, overly constrained circumstances uh, we built pretty high walls to retain the earth to make these outdoor classrooms, but we used that as an opportunity, as you see on the right, to create this soapstone seam that allowed a seep of stormwater through it that got conveyed into this gravel trough. The gravel trough got conveyed into a series of uh, shallow bioretention basins that stepped down the hill. The diagram on the right is tr simply trying to explain all the waters we took locally from roof and from impervious surfaces into these bioretention basins. Again, this ultimately heads back into a drain in the, on the Meadow Creek because we don't have a controlled system. But we were trying to explain that you know, any sediment you can drop out here, any kind of slowing of that pace of water, any revealing of it would be advantageous. So for instance, on the left, the typical curb and gutter that we had to deal with, we transformed that into a catchment that actually moved through or underneath the Gabion Wall and across, visibly across the path and into the, uh, the actual basins themselves. This is what the, the, those basins look like today as they're kind of grown in. Um, this is the, a real quick series then of the before and after. Uh, it, was a, it was a kind of unused, eroded slope of nothing but lawn and a little bit of gravel uh, piped underneath. Um, so this is a, a first sketch of that as the addition was uh, beginning to go up at how we would actually create a series of these basins. And note that these concrete weirs are intentionally have their slots or their cutouts staggered, so there's a kind of implied meander within that, uh, partly to slow water, partly to kind of recall a more natural process of water moving through it. Here you see it under construction. Here you see it kind of within the first year, actually first few months of being planted, and, and during a rain, and more particularly a heavy rain, very briefly, it has a drama to it, which, which is very brief. It is a, an ephemeral place. It does not have constantly flowing water. But, but for me, the most exciting part about this project is uh, that it really is expressive of, of the dynamism of nature in, in a very simple way. And so what I love about it is this was within the first year, but in the late spring. And you have, we have a mosaic of about five native plants here. So you, here you see the combination of the plant community and the infrastructure kind of having a kind of rapport, but just a few months later, that built infrastructure disappears, and it's really the kind of natural qualities of the cardinal flower and the little blue stem that become most expressive. So I'll close with this slide, kind of back to the point about constituencies and that we're doing this not just to control, manage quantity and quality of water, but really trying to engage people, uh, and, and we're trying to bring back a kind of greater biodiversity in what we do. Um, I feel privileged that we as landscape architects um, get to make these great, resilient, uh, and regenerative landscapes. And I'll close with a quote from Brenda Peterson, uh, who is, a, I think, a nature or wildlife writer, who said, um, like water, be gentle and strong. Be gentle enough to follow the natural paths of the earth and strong enough to rise up and reshape the world. Thanks. <laughs> I'm really glad you talked about plants and uh, the vegetation and as a landscape architect really thinking about the quality of the plants and kind of that temporality of them in the seasons. But uh, could you talk a little bit about how you use the plants knowing that water was running through them and the speed of the water and the frequency of it? Well, I have to say that the, the last one at Campbell Hall was deliberately kind of experimental uh, in, in a couple ways relative to plants was you know, how close can you plant those plants to the actual corridor? And, and we did plant them pretty close, but stayed a little bit of a way. And over time, you sort of see what adapts and what doesn't adapt. But I think the, the one image I showed where it's practically grown in is pretty cool because, again, it kind of comes and goes. The other thing about the plants that we're experimenting with there, and I don't have, I can't tell you exactly what the follow-up is yet, is we planted a, a grid of plants, a mosaic of uh, 
little blue stem, cardinal flower, um, uh, I'm going to forget the sensitive fern and one or two others. It was a shrub, but a deliberate mosaic that was on a grid, but but randomly sort of two cardinal flower here, three blue stem there, just to see. So it would look kind of naturalized, but also see what kind of competition might happen over time. And I think because it's at a school of architecture, we could argue for demonstration over time. And it's, so far, the species have held out pretty well. I mean, some we lost some. Uh, uh, what is it, uh, blue-eyed grass on the edge. It's a, I've learned over time that's a much more fickle plant, um, but, the, uh, but the mainstay plants have, have done pretty well. So, uh, And then another, I, I'm going to just follow that up with, on the, in Adele, in case someone might ask, you know, management is, and maintenance is a huge issue with these uh, new kinds of uh, stormwater, rainwater gardens. And we've had the opportunity to actually meet with and walk with the maintenance staff to explain to them our intentions. Yes, we need to pull the evasives out over time, but you don't manage this in quite the same way you would manage other places. For instance, that right off the bat, they said, you know, normally we, we, uh, we sweep out or rake out or blow out all the leaves of the beds. And we said, <laughs> let the leaves just lie there. You know, it seems like a waste of energy to do that. So just a little education over time. And, and the evasives are tough to manage. There's no question about it. And I talked to Mary Hughes before this talk. I said, what would you change or what would be different? She said, we just if we had more of a maintenance budget to deal with invasives, because they've been even tougher than we thought they would be. Other questions? Not Michael, but let's go to Kevin over here. <laughs> thank, oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Warren, for a great presentation and wonderful projects, beautifully detailed. Um, now that these have matured over time a little bit, is there, actually this is a two-part question, one, is there a favorite spot or a place uh, at the at the Dell, or uh, another? I guess the second part is: Has anything surprised you now that uh, now that they've gone through time a little bit? I I, I maybe I'm surprised it has been embraced so wholeheartedly. Uh, a favorite spot in the Dell is is where these kids people love to sit on the scupper. They love to walk across the weir wall, which was not meant to be walked across. So there's a desire path up the steep slope on the other side. Uh, but but what, the, one of the favorite spots is on just the other side of this image here, one of the meanders, one of the bow outs, there's a, there's a bench that was always there. I think they've improved it somewhat. And people love to sit there and kind of look back. And I think it's also because they can see wildlife coming and going. So what, surpri yeah, so what I said what surprised me is, is it, it's embraced. I think one of the, the greater success stories of this was this is on a scene between the community, a series of houses, and the university. And up to the point of creating the Dell, they, they were always in a contentious battle about this sort of no man's land and moving through. And now this has become a, as much a public park. And so the community has embraced it to the point where they almost monitor it as much or more than the university because they're using it every day. Thanks.